for $3,000 and only two weeks of prep. I spent three weeks going all around Japan. I'm sandwiched between my backpack, all of my electronics, in the middle of what is an already a tiny hole in the wall. What to do in Japan when it rains? Steal an umbrella. The goal was to go to Akitsuki Island, find the spot, camp, and then be like, ah, I did it. <laughs> I camped on an island out in the middle of nowhere in Japan. But that was it. Not to be comfy. And because I have to take this giant backpack across the ocean on a plane with me, I didn't have room for a sleeping bag, a floor mat, a anything. I got nothing. I'm wearing my clothes laying directly on the ground and my pillow is both my arm and kind of my travel book. What I didn't plan on or take the time to care enough to prepare for was that sleeping next to the ocean brings really cold air. So every time I woke up, the whole night, I just kind of added another piece of clothing until I was out of clothing and still cold. I'm clearly not gonna be rested by the end of this. So I'm just waiting out the sign that I can go do something else to lay here and going, please, it was fun, but I'm done now. When you travel the world, you probably don't have your data coming with your phone, unless you've got that sweet T-Mobile like data unlimited everywhere plan, and I didn't have the money for that. So the only way I could connect to the internet for the maps or to know when the train was, was have this separate little device that transmits data, but it also means it needs a battery. So now I have yet another device that I have to keep charged out here with no power. Once I realized where the power problems really could go, I turned everything off and I said, I'm just, just, I'm just gonna lay here. <laughs> and just be in my head to pass the time because the phone has to stay alive. It has to go off at a certain time. And if I miss that bus, I am screwed. So the most important thing in my campsite was the alarm on my phone at that point. So the power concerns are not just part of this night. They're kind of ever present. If I want to be on the phone too much, then I'm going to drain its power. I'm going to drain the Wi-Fi's power and then everything goes pot. So regularly, I actually power off the Wi-Fi and there's a little trick that your GPS still works with the satellite. So if you know how to read a map or you can kind of remember I'm going there on the map, you can load it up and you can't pull up all the details, but you can follow your little pin going through the map. And so the trick to saving power is knowing where you're look, going to, maybe screenshotting on your phone, and then following yourself on the map to get there. It'll help balance things out. Catching the bus really wasn't a problem now that I was awake. It was really a concern last night, especially after not sleeping so many times that I would eventually actually sleep and miss it. The bus came on time, unsurprisingly. It's Japan. When I get to the back, I hear as I go by. That magic word I've been waiting to hear the whole time. Gaijin. And roughly translated, Gaijin means foreigner. Although in contemporary use, it generally means white dude in Japan. I hadn't been called this yet. I've talked to you a bit about how I've been out of place, like in Hiroshima. So now that I'm out way, way away from where almost any tourist goes, it seems very appropriate for someone to be Gaijin? It was almost kind of validating, honestly, to be so far out that it was notable that I was there, not just part of the cloud of tourists. Getting back into Akitsuki, dropped off where I arrived, actually, which is a fun little loop and will be where I leave later, but it's gonna be a few hours till I can even get a bus, and so I wanna see some more of the island. Akitsuki Island is a notable place in Japan for two major reasons. Primarily the Hidden Christians and its association with the larger, more notable Hirado Island, but also is an incredible amount of whaling happened in Akitsuki, where it is positioned in the northwestern side of Kyushu on the Sea of Japan. Tons of opportunity for that. And I found a museum that covers both. Similarly to the rest of my experience on Akitsuki, I'm pretty much the only person. In fact, the only other people at the museum are the ones working, and they're incredibly friendly. In fact, they even offered to take my backpack from me and he would be behind the front counter, which was great because I was kind of dying. It's a good pack, but it's pretty heavy. I mean, we're talking like 40 pounds, so, you know, a break is nice. Once you get past the front desk of the museum, you turn the corner in this huge expansive room. I mean, we're talking whale skeletons on the ceiling, a 50 foot long diorama of a whaling expedition in the middle of the room. And, and you're, you're walking all the way around it. 
you've got even more dioramas of what it's like to do whale scouting from the cliff sides when they had just rowboats. All of these tools and means for whaling throughout the centuries. Now they're using many hundreds of yards long nets in a single boat. It's an incredible museum talking about how Ikitsuki has generated revenue and kept a population there over the years. And once you get through all of this history of what the production and economy of the island are, you turn a corner and it gets quite a bit darker, a lot more wood. And you see the other thing that Akitsuki is known for, and it's the hidden Christians. You see rosaries from hundreds of years ago. You see prayer hymnals. There's even a confessional, whole hog taken out of a church and preserved here. Photos of congregations celebrating on the rocks at the beach because it was on a cove that you couldn't see unless you knew where it was. Truly hidden Christians. And as someone who was raised Catholic, a lot of these symbols really resonate with me and that I know what they are, but there's also this really fascinating slight derivations on everything where the cross might have another crossbar or a couple more. I'm not sure what that means, but it's very consistent. And then there's some parchments and paintings of the Blessed Mother and Jesus and God in what is looks to be Japanese people. And for a religion that came out of the Middle East, celebrated primarily by Western countries, it's really fascinating to see this take on not a change of the religion, but an adaptation to the local population and believers there. This is all part of the very small amount of Western civilization allowed into Japan that has blossomed into a full-on addition to the Catholic world at large. That museum was awesome. I absolutely got to see the history of the hidden Christians that I came to this island to see, and I feel I didn't miss anything. This was great. But I do need to get on the bus because if I don't, it's gonna be another few hours until I can leave. I have to get all the way back up to Fukuoka. I mean, we're hundreds of kilometers away from where my bed tonight is, so I need to be at the bus station. And while I'm waiting, cause it's still another hour or so till it gets here, I gotta kill some time and I see cakes in a window across the street. And something sweet sounds nice. And turns out it's Castella cakes. And like I mentioned last episode about Samurai Champloo being set here on this island, Fu bought this Castella cake as a goodbye gift for Jean and Mugen, which in the Edo period would have been considered a very expensive and very kind gift. In fact, in Japanese culture, when you travel to places, it's considered proper to get a gift from that place. So getting a Castella cake on Akitsuki couldn't be more perfect. I'm gonna eat the whole cake myself, let's be honest. So I've got my cake in hand. I'm actually at the bus stop on time and the bus is on time. So now it's time to just do yesterday in reverse. So many vehicles. Getting off the train in Sasebo after having slept on an island that I wasn't wholly equipped for just to run into yet another thing I'm not equipped for. Rain. It's raining. What do you do when it rains in Japan anyway? Steal an umbrella. No, please stop, stop. Don't steal things in Japan. You won't come home. Besides, they're free. You don't need to steal them anyway. You didn't know? Yeah, okay, so look, if the umbrella has a white handle and a clear top, it's free. In fact, you'll see this outside of a lot of shops, especially train stations like here in Sasebo, where there's a whole umbrella rack and tons of these clear topped umbrellas. All you do, take them as long as you need them, and as soon as it's dry out, leave it at another store. That's it. Everybody can stay dry together. Now that I have my pilfered umbrella, I don't want to carry it. I'm a little extra tall from the backpack anyway, so what can I... I got it. I know. We can just slide it through here between the backpack and I can walk around like this looking like I'm unhappy about the rain, but really, I'm nice and dry. It's great. This free umbrella thing is awesome. The naval yard is what brought my Nana to Sasebo three decades ago. She lived here and told me stories about this when I'd go to her house and see the paintings on her wall. And now I know. I can take some photos for her and take it back to her and say, this is the city's thriving, it's changed, and, and this is what it is now. You may never make it back, but I wanna bring you there a little bit myself. And while that's awesome, I'm starting to get hungry. And there's a mall over here. I haven't really been around as much civilization yet, so let's check it out. 
especially that KFC. They've got to have something good. And in fact, you say, why are you going to KFC in Japan? Let me give you a piece of advice. Go to restaurants you know from your country, if they exist in other countries, and see how different they are. The Subway had a sandwich that was avocado and shrimp. Why America's not selling this, I don't know, but my money is ready. I've been arrogantly cramming in a ton of things today, hoping that I can push the trip back a little bit further, another hour here, another hour there, but if I don't get on the train now, I'm not gonna get to Fukuoka on time, and I honestly, I really gotta stop checking in after hours. And right after making that commitment about timeliness, guess what isn't? The train in Japan is a country famous for apologizing for arriving early. Okay, that's weird, but at least I've got another bingo square checked off. Now that I'm on the train of that cataclysmically 15 minute late train, I have some time to breathe. I need more planning in this trip, honestly. It's been great up until this point and I love how it's played out, but if I'm gonna do anything right and be sure it's taken care of, Tokyo will be it. I've got a week and a half out, but it's the last place I'm gonna be, so I need a great Airbnb. And I see this host, she has an awesome place, literally right across the river from Tsukiji Fish Market, only a 10 minute walk. 30 minutes from the subway and that'll take me to Akihabara. So she is gonna have the place I want. Instant book, it's mine. I got it, Tokyo's ready. So Fukuoka is hostel number two for me and this one's totally different from the one in Miyajima. This time it's a capsule hotel. This time checking in, I actually get to meet another human, which is excellent, especially because he's watching Bleach, an anime that I like quite a bit. This guy's name is Sven. He's a German man who came through here a little while ago. And by a little while ago, I mean a lot longer than he expected because when he got here, he thought he was just passing through. Then they needed help at the hostel, so he got a job at the hostel. And then by working at the hostel, he met some locals who needed somebody to teach their children English. So now he's teaching English on the side and bing, bang, boom, he's been in Japan for like nine months instead of the two weeks he thought. All right, I'm all checked in and now it's time to find out what the hell a capsule actually is. Is it? a tube where I pull a lid down over me? Do I like slide in like it's a drawer? No, no, it's significantly more mundane than that. It's a square hole in the wall, three foot, three foot, seven foot approximately, little ladder, and I don't even get a door. Nope, just a curtain on a drawstring and a lock box that doesn't fit all my stuff. So, ah, I think I'm gonna sleep with my bag. What we're also gonna do is finally get my power back because everything is dead. I mean, it, the Wi-Fi, the camera, the video camera, the iPod. Only my phone still has any juice in it. There can be only one. That's basically half a store's worth of electronics that need to charge, and I only have two outlets on the wall. So a little bit of planning did actually happen, turns out, before I left America, and I have an extension bar that adds one outlet into like four, I've got a couple USBs, now I have a web of cables coming out of my wall, so I'm sandwiched between my backpack, all of my electronics in the middle of what it is an already a tiny hole in the wall. But when I wake up, I'll have all my stuff charged. I'll be able to take photos again. I'm gonna have clean clothes. Tomorrow is gonna be excellent and smooth. Last night, I had no bed, and I was out in the middle of nowhere with no power. Tonight, it's cushy. I can actually charge all of my electronics, but I'm still going out in the middle of nowhere tomorrow with a four-hour train ride out to Karatsu that has this excellent festival with a dozen different highly detailed floats. And that's basically all I know. Let's go see what the street fair is all about. 